afternoon, everyone. It is 2.30. Welcome to CCDPH Schools in COVID-19 Weekly Update. My name is Kelly Jones. I am a senior health educator with Cook County Health Department in the Community Engagement and Health Education Unit. I'll be your host and moderator for our weekly webinars. Just a few updates from me before I toss it to Lex for your weekly update. As usual, our objectives are to support schools while um, navigating COVID-19, answer frequently asked questions, and provide the latest contact information and resources available from Cook County Health Department. Couple announcements. All of our webinars are recorded and they are uploaded to our Cook County Health Department website as well as CCDPH's YouTube page. So you can find those webinars at our CCDPH website backslash school dash health and also on our YouTube page. As usual, our slides will be sent out to our registered participants next week. Some general contact information for general um, CCDPH email address that is ccdph.covid19 at cookcountyhhs.org. If you have any communicable diseases that you would like to report, barring just COVID-19, it could be measles or, or chicken pox or things like that, you can email ccdph underscore schools at cookcountyhhs.org. Here is our Cook County Health Department website plus the school's website and a vaccine specific website with information. If you're interested in having any vaccine communication tools such as posters or flyers that you may print, you can find that all at the last link. That's our vaccine communication tools website. As we've discussed before, we know that certain areas have a lower vaccination uptake rate. So we are trying to influx support to these uh, areas and we're doing more community driven efforts and we're having mobile vaccination sites and other ways that we can support the communities. So the following communities are the communities that we're trying to pour a little more support into in addition to the rest of our communities within the neighborhood. For those who participate in the EpiPen prescription program, Keith Wynn is no longer the contact person for those requests. You can send that to me, Kelly Jones at kjones1 at cookcountyhhs.org. The request must come from a medical professional, i.e. school nurse, or they have to have been trained on the administration and medication. There are specific metrics that have to be met before you can become a trained EpiPen administrator. And all the requests must be typed inside the PDF form that you receive. If your school has an existing COVID-19 testing program, we'd like to hear about it. Please, please fill out the survey at the attached link. If your agency or organization would like to participate in the rapid antigen binex testing program, we are participating in distributing those along with IDPH and you can find out information at that website. There is a, wa a waiver program that you must fill out and be approved for before you can submit that request. In addition, you can also request those by next uh, kits directly from IDPH. And if you're interested in setting up the shield testing, you can contact the uh, IDPH at the following email address to set that up. If you are interested in having a health professional speak to your community event about COVID related subjects, you can submit a speaker request at the following Google Doc. Again, all of these slides and links will be sent to you next week in our emails. If you need a ride to a vaccine appointment, we have that available. That resource is available through partnerships through Kaizen. So you can uh, select a vaccine. If you need help finding a vaccine, you can uh, get assistance with that number and getting a vaccine. A vehicle will come pick you up. They will wait for you past your 15 minute observation time and drive you back home. There are, in, uh, in keeping with what we were saying about the community events that we're trying to uh, lend support to, there are a lot of community events coming up and they have all been updated on our CCDPH calendar, including mobile vaccination events and different community events we are participating in and we plan on adding a lot more, so please stay tuned. Again, if you cannot get to um, your vaccination appointment, but you because you're homebound, you can also call that 833 number to request someone to come to your house to vaccinate you due to the following stipulations, being 65 or older, have a disability or use adaptive equipment that makes it difficult for you to leave the house. You must be a Cook County suburban, a suburban Cook County resident, barring city of Chicago, Skokie, Evanston, 
Oak Park or Stickney because they have their own certified health departments. And this is some more information on mobile vaccine clinics and different resources. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. We will see you next week. Remember, we are recording this and all slides will be distributed later. So I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to toss it over to. Thanks, Kelly. I know we have some new people on the webinar today. Um, so if you don't know me already, I'm Lex Berta. I'm one of the epidemiologists in the CD unit here at CCDPH. And I am also a infectious disease fellow um, for the CDC. Um, hopefully you can now put a face to the name. And with that, let's get into it. Uh, so we're gonna go over housekeeping. Since there are new people, I'm just gonna cover some of the basics like how to report cases, um, bus guidance, lunch guidance. Um, so if you are uh, someone who's heard this a million times, you can check out for the first couple minutes if you need, I'll let you know when there's new information popping up. I'm gonna talk about a couple of studies that have come out recently and how they pertain to COVID and kids. Uh, quick metrics update like usual, travel guidance update, uh, IDPH updated their music guidance finally, so we've got that. Um, gonna go over outbreak testing and then the questions that were submitted for the week. Um, so housekeeping first, um, I just wanna remind everybody the CCDPH website has everything. Uh, it's got links to guidance. It's got um, how you, you know, report cases to us, instructions, the documents on how to do it, um, where to actually send it, the phone numbers. Um, so I spent a lot of time reorganizing it this summer to be more user friendly. Hopefully you guys find it more user friendly, but I promise it's a good place to start if you're looking for an answer to a question or if you need to report a case. Um, as a reminder, we do keep regular hours like any other place um, from 8.30 to 4.30. We do have someone on call after hours and on the weekends, but if it's not an outbreak, i.e. an emergency, you probably won't hear from us until uh, we return from the weekend, um, or in this case, after Labor Day for this week. Um, we do prioritize communications about outbreaks above all else, and our lowest priority is kind of um, like hypothetical situations that haven't actually occurred yet. We'll get to those if we can, um, but we do get a lot of contacts every single day. <laughs> so we might not get to those. Check the website. It's got a lot of info. Oh, and also I did wanna mention our CCDPH schools email that you see up here, that is secure. So you can send um, information about cases and contacts through that, it is totally fine. As a reminder, please don't forward our like personal CCDPH contact information, our work phone numbers um, to parents so that they can debate us about quarantine. Um, we recommend you keep track of the return dates for shortened quarantine. We will help you calculate those if you need that. And then if you receive a release letter, um, since you're keeping track of the return dates, please double check that um, because some people have been faking release letters. Um, so just make sure you're doing your due diligence there. Um, and of course, as always, and as you all do, please let parents know to expect a call from us um, so that when they see an unknown number and they don't wanna pick it up, it could be us calling about uh, contact tracing. And then just another reminder, um, different from the end of the last school year, the outbreak definition in schools is now two or more linked cases in the school setting um, that you know didn't have contact outside of the school setting. All right, so basics, reporting cases, you can find um, on our website, which I've linked here, um, you can find the form where you report, directions for how to fill it out, as well as where to send it. Um, and of course, you can always call or email us if you have questions about that too. Um, it's basically a spreadsheet, and this is um, just a little capture of part of it. Um, so you're going to you know, list the date you're reporting, the name of the school or the district, who this person is, if they're vaccinated. That's a new um, category um, for those of you who have been doing this for over a year and a half. Um, whether they're a confirmed case uh, and they have a positive test or a probable case, it's a symptomatic person who's been exposed. Um, but hasn't had a test result yet, or if they're just a close contact. Um, and of course, give us their full name to the best of your ability, if you know middle name, um, their date of birth, because you'd be surprised how many people have the same name, 
and then, um, you know, their contact information and then whatever other information you have, try to give us as many dates as possible. The date they were exposed, the date they were tested, obviously what the test result was, um, just so that we can help you calculate when someone might be able to return. So hopefully for those of you who are new, that helps go over reporting cases. Those directions are on our website in writing so you can see that as well. And of course, this will, these slides will also be sent out. I have a question before you move on. Absolutely. Um, with the new field for vaccinated, um, if we've already determined that a close contact was uh, vaccinated, you also you actually still want us to report. Yes, that's that information correct. to you. Yeah, just in case they become a breakthrough infection, then we can get that ball moving earlier. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And then I apologize. Should I have? Put that in the chat. I don't see any chat features right now. The chat features will pop up um, after this presentation is over, so you should be able to type that. But that question was super easy to answer. Okay, going apologies. forward, um, keep stuff for the chat, but not a big deal at all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, adaptive pause. Um, that's still a thing. If you feel like your school is in a situation where you might need to take an adaptive pause, um, we just ask that you notify that that is going to be happening. The guidance is um, still up on ISBE if you need to reference that. Hopefully we don't get to that point. Um, for buses, the only new information here is, um, since we've had a lot of questions about this, it's not exactly new information, but I want to emphasize a bus is not a classroom, so the close contact definition is within six feet on a bus. That doesn't mean you have to make sure everyone is sitting six feet apart on the bus. I know that's pretty much impossible in most situations. There's no capacity limit. You just have to know who is sitting within six feet of a case when they're on that bus. So you might need to do assigned seating on buses. Um, a good guideline for this is three rows in front, three rows behind, and obviously across the aisle. Um, masking is required on buses for the drivers and whoever is riding on the bus um, the whole time. Crack a window when it's nice out. Um, and if you are participating in test to stay, um, you should not ride the bus. We don't want that to be a barrier for a child to not attend school. Um, but when it's possible, do not ride the bus if you're doing test to stay. And then for lunch, obviously, that's going to be a time when people are talking more loudly. They have their masks off when they're eating. There's going to be a lot more aerosol production in that setting. So students really need to be six feet apart at lunch. If that's not possible because there's a space limit in your lunchroom or field house or wherever people are eating, then you need to be keeping a seating chart and know exactly who was sitting where for contact tracing purposes. Um, if a student is participating in test to stay, they should probably eat, um, you know, by themselves in a classroom under supervision, or um, if that's not possible, they need to be six feet away from everybody else. There's no room for negotiation there, six feet away at minimum. And then obviously hand hygiene, good all the time. Um, symptomatic siblings and other household contacts. We're still waiting for IDPH to put out the guidance on this, um, but we are operating under this procedure. So if someone becomes symptomatic at school or they don't feel good enough to go to school, their sibling or if, you know, like their parent is a teacher or works at the school has 24 hours um, to wait for that symptomatic person's test result before they have to not go to school or work anymore. So um, let's say, someone's older sister gets sent home from school because she's got COVID-like symptoms, that sibling does not need to be sent home at the same time. They just can't come to school the next day while they're waiting for those test results. Um, you guys know the quarantine options by now. This is just for reference. Um, test to stay, test to stay, more test to stay, <laughs> hopefully every imaginable scenario with this so that it answers all your questions. And then, um, we did get a couple of questions about how you know which quarantine option is acceptable. So this is the same slide as it's been, but a good reference for you guys. All right, so if you guys checked out, now is all the new information. Um, so a couple new studies and statistics came out this week about kids and COVID. Um, the first is that over a quarter of new cases are pediatric cases um, on a weekly basis. This is largely being driven by Texas and Florida, 
Um, but it's something to keep in mind. Part of that is because so many adults are vaccinated, um, but that's still a pretty alarming percentage. Um, with that increase, uh, hospitalization of children and adolescents has also gone up over the summer when you would kind of normally expect it to go down because people are spending more time outdoors. Um, so that's also a little bit of a red flag. Um, hospitalization rates for adolescents who could be vaccinated were much, much worse among unvaccinated teens compared to vaccinated teens. So that still makes a big difference among the teenage population too. In the U.S. as a whole, um, COVID cases, emergency department visits, hospital admissions increased for pediatric people um, from just basically all summer. Um, in states where there was a lower proportion of people who are vaccinated, that percentage of emergency department visits and hospital admissions was over four times higher than states with higher vaccination coverage. Luckily, we have pretty good vaccination coverage in the state, but it's something to keep an eye on. Um, and then related, but on a different vein, in a survey that was done of U.S. parents, um, overall, there was a small association found between distance learning and um, mental health problems. And I'm sure all of you in the school field could have predicted that. But um, something of note is that Black and Hispanic families were more likely to both report distance learning and also report more mental health difficulties for their children. Um, and then in the older age group, which is, again, probably not a surprise for those of you who work with teens, um, they also reported more mental health problems than younger students doing distance learning. So the associations were small. It's not alarming, but it is something to keep in mind and consider when you're deciding how to proceed dealing with COVID in your school district. All right, metrics update. We are up from where we were the last time we met in test positivity and weekly case rates. Uh, the last time we talked, there were only a few school outbreaks in Illinois, and now there are 81 <laughs> current outbreaks and 10 are in Cook. Um, you can see we're about from, so the lower graph is from IDPH and the upper graph is from us at Suburban Cook. Um, we're about where we were in November of last year in terms of cases of for young people. Um, it's not looking great, um, but that is where we are. We'll keep an eye on it and let you guys know we are in high community transmission and I don't think that surprises anybody. For travel guidance, the entire map is now <laughs> in travel advisory, including our territories. Um, so travel's not a great thing to do right now if you're unvaccinated. If you aren't vaccinated, do not travel. Unvaccinated children should not travel. Now is the time to think about camping or taking a day trip to Starved Rock or things like that. Um, vaccinated travelers have to monitor their health for 14 days after they return. Um, testing or a short quarantine is highly recommended, but it's not required. For unvaccinated travelers, though, they do need to quarantine for at least seven days upon return. If they don't get tested, that quarantine is bumped up to 10 days. If they do get tested and it's negative, they can return after seven days. Um, if there is some international travel, we are following CDC guidelines for that. Um, obviously, airlines are vetting people um, who are coming on international flights. All right, the updated music guidance is not too different from what we've been practicing, um, but anybody playing in the orchestra or band or in general music settings and in the guidance, this included both choir and um, the color guard or dance team, um, or people who are dancing for the marching band, things like that, need to be wearing a mask. For wind instruments, masks can be pulled down to play um, when they're like actively playing, but they need to be placed back over the nose and mouth if they've got like eight bars of rest in a slow tempo song or something, or when they're just not playing, um, like maybe it's um, like music theory time or something like that. Uh, for they, they can be removed um, when you're outside. Um, masks aren't required then, and you have to be six feet apart when you're outside. For wind and brass instruments, a cloth covering um, that is two layers uh, can be added or needs to be added over the bell of the instrument as well. Um, students need to be seated at least six feet apart. Um, 
but the close contact definition for when music is actually being played um, in a wind instrument setting is six feet um, because that's a situation where masks are being removed and there's aerosols being created. If there's no music being played, but you're being taught like in a band class with everybody properly masked, then the close contact definition is three feet because that's more akin to a classroom setting. Um, obviously, minimize shared instruments um, and even minimize stand sharing and sheet music. Um, you know, if you've got a stand partner, you guys are going to be leaning closer together to see the music. So sharing at a minimum. Uh, rehearsal should be limited to around 50 minutes of playing, singing or dancing. Um, and then the room should be aired out for one air exchange um, prior to the use of the next room. Like if you've got kids, you know, setting up their instruments and stuff, just kind of have them do it a little slow while everything gets aired out. Um, for students that are participating in test to stay, they cannot, no matter what, play their instrument indoors during their quarantine period. If they're outside and they can distance, then they can play their instrument with the band, but otherwise they're just going to have to participate in other distanced masked ways, like transcribing sheet music or things like that. Okay, outbreak testing. Um, we've talked a little bit about this and we've had some questions that have been answered, but we talked about this um, on the state call this week and I wanted to give you guys a little bit more information. So within three days of the outbreak declaration, that's when outbreak, outbreak testing needs to start. Um, beforehand, and I highly suggest you do this now at the beginning of the school year, schools should obtain parental consent for student testing at the beginning of the year. Um, hopefully before there's an outbreak um, to accommodate for outbreak testing. You do not need to have a screening program in place to get these consent forms in for outbreak testing. It will save a lot of trouble um, if an outbreak does arise and it will keep kids in school. So you can just sign up for outbreak testing if you're not interested in screening to do with shield assistance. Um, Outbreak testing will happen twice weekly for unvaccinated individuals in the school setting, and that can be targeted to the classroom or the grade or the activity where stuff happened, or it could just be everybody in the school. Um, this is the update I wanted to give you. So if you signed up with SHIELD and you have an outbreak, IDPH and SHIELD will assist you with the first week of testing, and that includes administration, transportation of the tests, and reporting. But after the first week, the school is responsible for the testing, um, and that includes collection and transportation if it's a shield test to a shield lab or a drop site. Um, luckily in Cook County, those are not in short supply there. You can get to them pretty quickly. Um, alternatively, though, schools can pay for a medical courier to uh, through shield. They can provide you with that contact information um, to cover transportation and schools will be reimbursed for their um, collection of tests and test submissions for the weeks when IDPH and SHIELD are not assisting you, so for weeks two through four. So I just wanted to let you guys know more of what that procedure is like and how um, SHIELD assists during an outbreak test. So basically, they get you going, but you have to finish the process on your own. And it's, it's much more difficult if you do not have that assistance from SHIELD and IDPH. Um, and also, really difficult if you don't have parental consent forms already taken care of. Um, I think the state said they're getting around three outbreak assistance requests per day lately, so um, they're very busy. Um, and then testing, just going back to this, testing should continue until the school has gone two incubation periods or 28 days without identifying any new cases, and then the outbreak testing can stop. So it's a long process. Um, people can potentially be infectious and developed disease for a long period of time with COVID. All right, um, this is just a reference on how to sign up uh, or sign uh, set up testing infrastructure in your school. Um, IDPH said because of how overloaded they are right now with outbreaks, um, they will not be fulfilling additional Binax requests if schools didn't already get people signed up and consented for outbreak testing. Um, they just don't have the supplies. All right, submitted questions. Uh, first question, our administration is informing us that we are required to offer all four quarantine options to close contacts. Is this true? Um, what is CCDPH's recommendation, basically? So we will always recommend 14 days of quarantine. That is the gold standard, um, but a school district can choose to allow any of the shortened quarantine options 
if they can provide an environment where people are distanced and masked, as well as understand that a shortened quarantine option can bring in more administrative responsibilities that the school has to fulfill. Um, so that is up to the district. 14 days, I think, kind of makes it easy. It's easy to just calculate it by looking at the calendar. Um, second question, we have a local physician who wants to know if she can write a note after she examines a symptomatic child after a negative antigen test that states there is no clinical suspicion of COVID-19 and they do not require PCR testing. We have told families that we do require PCR testing and the doctor states that they should be able to use their clinical judgment. Would this note be acceptable or do they have to have a PCR after a doctor's visit? And this is a good question that I think needs to be clarified. If a clinician has performed a rapid test and clinically rules out COVID-19, writing a note saying that there's no clinical suspicion of COVID-19 um, is sufficient for that student or staff member to return. A confirmatory PCR isn't necessary when you have a physician's input and evaluation. If a rapid antigen test was run in a different setting without any kind of clinical evaluation, then you do need a confirmatory PCR to return. So hopefully that clarifies. It's kind of rapid with physician input or rapid plus PCR to return. If um, you, know, you don't have any known exposures, you've just got some COVID symptoms. Uh, third question, in the past, a positive rapid for all purposes was considered a positive regardless of any further testing and then the child has to complete that isolation. Has this guidance changed? A student had a positive uh, uh, antigen test after several episodes of vomiting and a sore throat, and then in the following days received a few negative PCR tests. Um, we told the family that they can't test out of isolation. Is this correct? Yes, that is correct. With our current levels of transmission, no matter the kind of test, a positive is a positive. Full stop. Um, and a positive means that someone needs to isolate immediately. Even if you get a negative test in the next couple of days, you can't test out of isolation at that point. Um, it could be that you caught, you know, you caught your illness at the end, um, but we just don't know for sure. So um, you could be positive one day and then negative the next. Um, and that doesn't mean those tests were wrong. So a positive is a positive, full stop. Uh, with the mandated weekly testing of all unvaccinated school staff members, can we do Binax? And then if we're doing Binax, can staff members perform the nasal swab themselves if they're being supervised by a trained professional? And yes, um, Binax is totally fine for that testing. Um, but if they do a self swab, that does have to be under supervision. It could be done, you know, if someone's really concerned about privacy, it can be done, you know, in a classroom with just them and the school nurse or something like that. Um, but it does need to be done under supervision. All right, only two more slides of submitted questions and we'll get to the chat. Um, a family in my district that has two students that were exposed to COVID before school started, they ended up being positive and developing symptoms. Uh, it turns out during their isolation, the mom tested positive um, and the kids still didn't feel good after the end of their isolation. So I extended their quarantine, which was the right move. The kids were or extended their isolation, which is the right move if they're not feeling well enough to go to school still. Then when I called at the end of that, turns out the father is actually hospitalized for COVID-19. Um, the kids are feeling well now. Do I need to extend their isolation with their dad in the hospital? Um, this is a long scenario, <laughs> um, but because the kids converted to cases, um, they can return to school 10 days after either their symptoms began or um, in this case, their symptoms began, or whether they tested positive and didn't have symptoms if it's other kids. Um, so after those 10 days, as long as they're feeling up to going back to school, they can go back to school. You have to be fever free for the last 24 hours before you can return. Even if people in their family go on to develop COVID-19, after 10 days, if you're feeling okay, you're no longer infectious. Um, so they can return. I. No, that's a really difficult situation and I hope everyone, you know, starts to feel better as soon as possible. Next question. I have a question about a homecoming parade. Uh, our local high school has a homecoming parade and comes past our grade schools during the day. We typically line the kids up and they watch the homecoming parade. 
I know we have been told that kids can play outside and not be masked, and unless they're in a huddle for 15 minutes, like wrestling, they would not be considered close contacts. What about watching the parade? It's typically not long, but potentially over 15 minutes. Can they be in masks because it's outside? Um, and one, that sounds super fun, but two, that's a great question. Um, if the students are going to be huddled together in a crowded space, they should probably mask up, especially if it's potentially going to be over 15 minutes. But if you can spread them out a little bit, unmasked is going to be fine outside. Next question, districts around us are stating that those who travel for less than 24 hours, Wisconsin, for example, still need to be quarantined for seven days post-travel, assuming they're unvaccinated. Um, can you confirm if this is true? So those who travel for less than 24 hours still need to quarantine after travel if they are unvaccinated. Um, if you're somewhere for more than 24 hours, your chances of being exposed just because of time are larger, but being somewhere for 24 hours or less doesn't mean you can't be exposed. So if the traveler just passed through a state with a travel advisory, which is all of them at the moment, like they didn't leave their vehicle at all, they were on a train passing through Michigan or um, all they did was stop to get gas, they don't have to quarantine. But if it's a day trip to go visit a relative or um, you know, they stopped and ate at a restaurant where people weren't masked, there's still potential there to be exposed. So they will have to quarantine. If possible, do not travel at the moment if you're unvaccinated is really the best answer there. All right. Has there been any guidance on if water fountains can be turned back on in schools? Absolutely, water fountains can be back on in schools. Just emphasize hand hygiene before and after use and make sure they're cleaned thoroughly and often. Um, after a modified quarantine of seven or 10 days or after practicing in, or participating in test to stay, when are students allowed back into the lunchroom or on the school bus? So for test to stay, students can ride the bus and eat with everyone after their 14 days of their testing quarantine. So once they're through those 14 days, they're good to go. For other shortened quarantine options, they can still ride the bus and eat lunch normally right after their quarantine ends. So after the seven or 10 days, What's important is they're still monitoring how they're feeling for the full 14 days um, and they stay masked and distanced as much as possible, um, masked all the time, but distanced as much as possible in other settings. We have heard that some districts have been given guidance that the test to stay option is available to students who are close contacts from exposure in the lunchroom setting when students are not wearing masks. Can you clarify if students who are exposed at lunch are able to test to stay? Uh, if the, you know, there's a screening test program in place. Um, so a lunch exposure is not eligible for test to stay. Um, and IDPH said this this week in our meeting with them um, it, because masks aren't being worn. Um, so that automatically makes them ineligible. If it's like they were in the lunchroom standing in line to get a Gatorade and they were four, they were like six feet apart and masked, then maybe that could work for test to stay if somehow everybody caught that that was the scenario. Um, but assuming that's not the scenario, masks are going to be off, people are going to be talking loudly, lunchroom exposures don't count for test to stay. Can household close contacts test out of quarantine if they obtain a negative PCR after day six of quarantine from the positive case? So a household contact cannot test out of quarantine until the isolation period of whoever is the actual case is finished. So from when the case starts their isolation to when they end, every time they see their household contact is a new opportunity to be exposed. So the first day of the last bit of the close contacts quarantine is actually the last day of the case's isolation. That's the last possible time they could be exposed. So after that isolation period is over, they can get out of uh, quarantine early after that period. Um, so they can then get tested on day six to come back on day eight. Um, but you can't do that until the final quarantine period has started um, after that case's isolation. It's a long process, I know. Um, can you quickly review acceptable tests again for return for students? PCR, PCR rapid, rapid antigen. Um, would love a quick refresher. If um, you guys want to put in the chat, you want like a more in-depth answer to this next week, I can certainly do that. 
But um, my short answer is at this time, the only acceptable test for returning without a clinical evaluation um, for an alternative diagnosis is RT-PCR. This is not a rapid PCR. Um, rapid tests along with a clinician's note um, for no suspicion of COVID is also acceptable to return. But if you're talking just tests for returning, it's only RT-PCR. When we get into a place where our transmission is lower, we can think about including other tests. But um, as you saw from our metrics update, that's not going to be anytime soon. All right, I am going to stop sharing my screen and go to the chat and I am going to, we're going to try something different with the chat questions today. Um, if they haven't already been answered, I am going to read the questions to Pollock and she's going to answer them for you guys. All right. Our students identified as close contacts on the bus and at lunch still eligible for test to stay testing. Um, Paula, do you want to take that? Yes, um, I for our students identified as close contacts on the bus um, for they they can they can be eligible for test to stay as long as a testing program is established in your school. And also, uh, I, I think um, Lexi already mentioned that uh, we do not recommend close contacts who are already on test to stay to ride the bus. I think some of the questions um, Michelle has been answering, I've been monitoring the chat. There are just very few uh, questions. I think the last question is the one that's not. All right, then I will read that one. We have a bus aide who tested positive. What is the next step? What is the guidance for masked students or students who are less than six feet or three feet from that aide? The bus aide walks up and down the aisle and helps kids in and out. That's a great question. Yes, it's, um, I think in this, um, is this, I think in this scenario, it's, I would say it's best to take a conservative approach and we would have to um, recommend quarantine for these children in the entire bus, especially if the bus aide who's been positive walking up and down the aisles. Um, I mean, it would be very difficult to time the exposure. We, it's, it would be just difficult to assess, um, you know, three feet, six feet, masking and social dis yeah. What do you think, Lex? I think, right, at this point in the pandemic with the number of cases we're seeing in kids now, it's important to take a conservative approach um, in these situations, especially um, if it's an adult case exposing people who are younger, um, they're usually more infectious, so. Um, a follow-up question from if a household member can take a shortened quarantine, if the household member is able to isolate from the case, um, like maybe there's an apartment in the basement or something like that, can they do the shortened quarantine option? This was a question at 3.03, Pollock. Yeah, I, I did read that question. Um, I mean, in the parenthesis, um, I forgot who wrote it, but said, you know, having their own room. But I would say also were the, what were the other areas that um, the case was uh, sharing with the household members, for example, kitchen, bathroom. So ideally it would be best if the case can be isolated completely, no sharing of communal areas, then um, the sibling of the case or family member of the case would be able to uh, be implemented the shortened quarantine. But generally it's a little difficult so we would need to really ask questions about what is the household situation is like, and um, it's always best to take the conservative approach, especially now. All right, um, next question that just came in. Um, when the new decision tree comes up, is CCDPH going to accept alternative diagnosis notes? Well, we have no idea. The IDPH has, um, you know, been saying, 
I, I, I believe the draft is stuck at the governor's office for approval to be published, but until until it comes out, we just don't like to um, hypothesize what's going to happen because who knows what may get changed. If we say something and the updated document has something different, we just again don't want to start uh, repeating this new information and it loses trust as well. So, so uh, for now, we don't know right now, we are just using the decision tree that's already been published. So until it comes out, then we will begin um, uh, recommending. Until, until anything's written and published, it's written in stone, we won't recommend those. Regarding travel guidance for unvaccinated individuals, is this travel guidance advisory or is it enforceable? Well, it is uh, highly recommended. We cannot enforce, but um, I would say as school community, we do need to, it would be ideal to make sure that people, uh, students and staff who are traveling are, uh, you know, uh, following the recommendations just because we have, it's our, so, uh, it would be our social responsibility to make sure that the other school community members are not at risk. Is home testing okay if, or is home testing okay for unvaccinated employees um, per the vaccine or testing mandate for work in, or school employees? Uh, right now, we are not accepting home tests because if, obviously, if a home test is positive, uh, we are going to consider that as a positive case, but we still recommend that the person does go to the doctor for clinical evaluation and get a lab-based PCR. Um, I think it will be more case by case basis if a person who is positive with a home test and has the classic symptoms like fever, muscle fatigue, um, loss of taste and smell, then you know, no matter what subsequent test PCR comes up, we are going to consider that as a positive. So um, for the most part, if it's a negative home test, again, home uh, lab-based PCR, um, ideally clinical evaluation, if a home test is uh, positive, then we are going to consider that as a positive case. And again, confirmation of PCR and clinical evaluation, because it's possible we cannot make sure in the home test if the uh, specimen is collected properly, but the the chances of home tests being uh, false positive are low. But again, don't quote me on it. Next question. Um, if we have parents reporting a positive case after 10 days when we sent a symptomatic person home and those 10 days have passed, so this person is isolated, do we still need to quarantine the classroom when we find out about that positive, even though it's so late? Are we talking, um, you'll find out after the child has come back after 10 days? Kind of seems like that's the context of the question. By that point, it's no use. <laughs> this, um, you know, it would be ideal to then just, um, we could investigate and ask who's having symptoms. Uh, obviously, anybody who's having symptoms should get tested anyway, stay home for respiratory symptoms, um, fever, but at this point, I just don't know. It would be case by case basis. We would have to really assess the situation. Yeah, I would say um, for the person who asked this question, maybe email us directly and we can talk to you about this. Um, next question. Can close contacts participating in test to stay continue playing volleyball? Well, I think uh, being, of course, outside with the, you would have to look at the, um, the guidance by CDC. There is one for high risks, um, high risk contact sports and IDPH did pull down uh, that guidance where it did it had categories of high risk, which which sports fall into high risk, medium risk, and low risk. Um, but as far as I know, I think they should be okay. I would have to check. So if you don't mind emailing me, I will uh, double check the guidance and I can get back to you. 
Um, I'm going to ask this one out loud and then answer it because it's a quick answer. For indoor lunch, are students considered close contacts if they are sitting three feet apart for longer than 15 minutes? Excuse my phone there. And have their masks off due to eating and drinking? Yes. So if there are no masks on, the close contact definition is six feet automatically. Um, and during lunch, to the best of your ability, they should be six feet apart. If they can't be, you just need to be keeping track of who is sitting where. Um, next question, according to the decision tree, if it is not a close contact situation, a negative RT-PCR, um, rapid PCR, or negative antigen test is acceptable for symptomatic individuals. Is this different in CCDPH's jurisdiction? Um, if you read further in that statement, it leaves it up to the local health department to decide based on local transmission levels. Um, what is acceptable and as you saw from our metrics our local transmission is very high so we are only accepting the gold standard tests if an employee tested positive last week and will be undergoing weekly testing due to the executive order will they be exempt from testing for 90 days because they could potentially test positive for some time after the infection Yes, I think if you've had this question, um, I've heard this before. If a person has tested positive um, and has isolated, finished uh, all the isolation, then it's ideal that they don't um, participate in test to stay for up to 90 days. And I think that also answers the next question, um, the specific length of time for not needing to get tested after a natural infection, sorry, um, is 90 days. All right, if that's everything, um, if you think of more questions, you guys can email it to us um, and we'll either get to it as soon as we can or include it in the slides next week. And I just wanted to say thank you so much to the school community for being so patient with us as we try to answer the questions. Uh, we are a small team, not like we were last year when we had um, other epidemiologists from other programs helping us. So. Uh, we are trying our best. We created this new email. We are prioritizing emergency situations such as outbreaks or, um, you know, and then we'll, we'll prioritize based on the questions. We do say we'll uh, return your email uh, within 24 hours, but it may take longer. Um, so again, like I said, we are trying our best and thank you for being patient with our contact tracers, case investigators, and um, we are always available for um, any guidance question during our business hours? <laughs> I think there are a couple more questions. Okay. Oh, oh, Lexa answered. Sorry, Kelly. No, that's okay. I couldn't tell where the voice was coming from, so I was looking at all the boxes. Okay, who was that that was talking? Was that Michelle's voice? No. <laughs> no? I don't know where the voice came from. I'm sorry, but... Um, I forgot what I was going to say. I lost my train of thought. Oh, Jenna, if you wouldn't mind grabbing the chat, because I think there may be a few questions that we didn't get a chance to cover. Already got it all. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. And maybe no we can get to those questions next time. Thank you, Palak, for your assistance. Thank you, Lex, as usual. As Palak said, we are a small, we are a large health department, but we are small staff. So we have a small amount of people doing a lot of superhero work. So we appreciate your patience and your kindness. It is not easy. Just a small tip. Is I get a few emails during the webinar and I am a one woman show, so I can't respond to the emails that you sent on Eventbrite during the webinar or you sent to me personally, so I will get that. But just a tip, all of you are on here, so you have made it. But in the event that you have any te technical difficulties, I would just suggest logging out, logging back in, or there is always a phone number that's listed in the Eventbrite to call in if you're having some technical difficulties as I'm unable to to help you troubleshoot during the webinar. So again, we just want to thank you for your patience and we will see you next Friday. And remember the webinar is being recorded and uploaded to our website and our YouTube page and the slides will go out to register participants. Vanessa Duffy, if you could email me afterwards and then we can try to figure out what's going on with you, I'd appreciate it. Thank you all. You have a nice Friday and enjoy the warm weather tomorrow. Be well.